Prologue. The gale tore at him, and he felt its bite deep within, and he knew that if they did not make land fall in three days, they would all be dead. Too many deaths on this voyage, he thought. I'm pilot major of a dead fleet. One ship left out of five. Eight and twenty men from a crew of one hundred and seven, and now only ten can walk, and the rest near death, and our captain general one of them. No food, almost no water, and what there is brackish and foul. His name was John Blackthorn, and he was alone on deck, but for the bowsprit lookout, Salomon the mute, who huddled in the lee, searching the sea ahead. The ship heeled in a sudden squall, and Blackthorn held on to the arm of the sea chair that was lashed near the wheel on the quarter deck, until she righted, timbers squealing. She was the Erasmus, two hundred and sixty tons, a three-masted trader warship out of Rotterdam, armed with twenty cannon and sole survivor of the first expeditionary force sent from the Netherlands to ravage the enemy in the New World. The first Dutch ships ever to breach the secrets of the Strait of Magellan. Four hundred ninety-six men, all volunteers, all Dutch except for three Englishmen, two pilots, one officer. Their orders: to plunder Spanish and Portuguese possessions in the New World, and put them to the torch; to open up permanent trading concessions; to discover new islands in the Pacific Ocean that could serve as permanent bases; and to claim the territory for the Netherlands, and within three years to come home again. Protestant Netherlands had been at war with Catholic Spain for more than four decades, struggling to throw off the yoke of their hated Spanish masters. The Netherlands, sometimes called Holland, Dutch Land, or the Low Countries, were still legally part of the Spanish Empire. England, their only allies, the first country in Christendom to break with the papal court at Rome, and become Protestant some seventy odd years ago, had also been warring on Spain for the last twenty years. And openly allied with the Dutch for a decade. The wind freshened even more, and the ship lurched. She was riding under bare poles, but for storm topsails. Even so, the tide and the storm bore her strongly toward the darkening horizon. There's more storm there, Blackthorn told himself, and more reefs and more shoals, an unknown sea. Good. I've set myself against the sea all my life, and I've always won. I always will. First English pilot ever to get through Magellan's Pass. Yes, the first, and first pilot ever to sail these Asian waters, apart from a few bastard Portuguese or motherless Spaniards, who still think they own the world. First Englishman in these seas. So many firsts. Yes, and so many deaths to win them. Again, he tasted the wind and smelled it, but there was no hint of land. He searched the ocean, but it was dull, grey, and angry. Not a fleck of seaweed or splash of colour to give a hint of a sanding shelf. He saw the spire of another reef far on the starboard quarter, but that told him nothing. For a month now, outcrops had threatened them, but never a sight of land. This ocean's endless, he thought. Good, that's what you were trained for—to sail the unknown sea, to chart it, and come home again. How many days from home? One year and eleven months and two days, the last landfall, Chile, one hundred and thirty-three days after, across the ocean, Magellan had first sailed eighty years ago, called Pacific. Blackthorn was famished, and his mouth and body ached from the scurvy. He forced his eyes to check the compass course, and his brain to calculate an approximate position. Once the plot was written down in his rudder, his sea manual. He would be safe in this speck of the ocean, and if he was safe, his ship was safe. And then together they might find the Japans, or even the Christian king Prester John and his golden empire, that legend said lay to the north of Cathay, wherever Cathay was. And with my share of the riches, I'll sail on again westward for home. First English pilot ever to circumnavigate the globe, and I'll never leave home again, never, by the head of my son. The cut of the wind stopped his mind from wandering and kept him awake. To sleep now would be foolish. You'll never wake from that sleep, he thought, and stretched his arms to ease the cramped muscles in his back, and pulled his cloak tighter around him. He saw that the sails were trimmed and the wheel lashed secure. The bow lookout was awake, so patiently he settled back and prayed for land. Go below, pilot. I take this watch if it pleases you. 
The third mate, Hendrik Spetsch, was pulling himself up the gangway, his face grey with fatigue, eyes sunken, skin blotched and sallow. He leaned heavily against the binnacle to steady himself, retching a little. Blessed Lord Jesus, piss on the day I left Holland. Where's the mate, Hendrik? In his bunk. He can't get out of his shite for a bunk. And he won't, not this side of Judgment Day. And the Captain General? Moaning for food and water. Hendrik spat. I tell him I roast him a capon and bring it on a silver platter with a bottle of brandy to wash it down. Shite house. Cut. Hold your tongue. I will tell it, but he's a maggot-eaten fool, and we'll be dead because of him. The young man wretched and brought up mottled phlegm. Blessed Lord Jesus, help me. Go below, come back at dawn. Hendrik lowered himself painfully into the other sea chair. There's the reek of death below. I take the watch, if it pleases you. What's the course? Wherever the wind takes us. Where's the landfall you promised us? Where's the Japans? Where is it, I ask? Ahead. Always ahead, got him himmel, it wasn't in our orders to sail into the unknown. We should be back home by now, safe, with our bellies full, not chasing St. Elmo's fire. Go below or hold your tongue. Sullenly, Hendrik looked away from the tall, bearded man. Where are we now, he wanted to ask. Why can't I see the secret rutter? But he knew you don't ask those questions of a pilot, particularly this one. Even so, he thought, I wish I was as strong and healthy as when I left Holland. Then I wouldn't wait. I'd smash your grey blue eyes now and stamp that maddening half smile off your face and send you to the hell you deserve. Then I'd be Captain Pilot, and we'd have a Netherlander running the ship, not a foreigner, and the secrets would be safe for us. Because soon we'll be at war with you, English. We want the same thing, to command the sea, to control all trade routes, to dominate the new world, and to strangle Spain. Perhaps there is no Japan's. Hendrik muttered suddenly. It's got be one legend. It exists between latitude 30 and 40 north. Now hold your tongue or go below. There's death below, pilot. Hendrik muttered and put his eyes ahead, letting himself drift. Blackthorn shifted in his sea chair, his body hurting worse today. You're luckier than most, he thought. Luckier than Hendrik. No, not luckier, more careful. You conserved your fruit while the others consumed theirs carelessly, against your warnings. So now your scurvy is still mild, whereas the others are constantly hemorrhaging, their bowels diuretic, their eyes sore and roomy, and their teeth lost or loose in their heads. Why is it men never learn? He knew they were all afraid of him, even the captain general, and that most hated him. But that was normal, for it was the pilot who commanded at sea. It was he who set the course and ran the ship. He who brought them from port to port. Any voyage today was dangerous because the few navigational charts that existed were so vague as to be useless. And there was absolutely no way to fix longitude. Find out how to fix longitude and you're the richest man in the world. His old teacher, Alban Caradoc, had said, the Queen, God bless her, will give you ten thousand pound and a dukedom for the answer to the riddle. The dung-eating Portuguese will give you more, a golden galleon, and the motherless Spaniards will give you twenty. Out of sight of land, you're always lost, lad. Caradoc had paused and shaken his head sadly at him as always. You're lost, lad, unless... Unless you have a rutter, Blackthorne had shouted happily, knowing that he'd learned his lessons well. He was thirteen then, and had already been apprenticed a year to Alban Caradoc, pilot and shipwright, who had become the father he had lost, who had never beaten him but taught him and the other boys the secrets of shipbuilding and the intimate way of the sea. A rutter was a small book containing the detailed observation of a pilot who'd been there before. It recorded magnetic compass courses between ports and capes, headlands and channels. It noted the sounding and depths and colour of the water and the nature of the seabed. It set down the how we got there and how we got back. How many days on a special tack, the pattern of the wind, when it blew and from where, what currents to expect and from where, the time of storms and the time of fair winds, where to careen the ship and where to water, where there were friends and where foes, shoals, reefs, tides, havens. At best, everything necessary for a safe voyage. The English, Dutch and French had rutters for their own waters, 
but the waters of the rest of the world have been sailed only by captains from Portugal and Spain, and these two countries considered all rutters secret. Rutters that revealed the seaways to the New World or unraveled the mysteries of the Pass of Magellan and the Cape of Good Hope, both Portuguese discoveries, and thence the seaways to Asia, were guarded as national treasures by the Portuguese and Spanish, and sought after with equal ferocity by their Dutch and English enemies. But a writer was only as good as the pilot who wrote it, the scribe who hand copied it, the very rare printer who printed it, or the scholar who translated it. A writer could therefore contain errors, even deliberate ones. A pilot never knew for certain until he'd been there himself, at least once. At sea, the pilot was leader, sole guide, and final arbiter of the ship and her crew. Alone, he commanded them from the quarter deck. That's heady wine, Blackthorn told himself, and once sipped, never to be forgotten, always to be sought, and always necessary. That's one of the things that keep you alive when others die. He got up and relieved himself in the scuppers. Later, the sand ran out of the hourglass by the binnacle, and he turned it and rang the ship's bell. Can you stay awake, Hendrick? Yes, yes, I believe so. I'll send someone to replace the bow lookout. See, he stands in the wind and not in the lee. That'll keep him sharp and awake. For a moment, he wondered if he should turn the ship into the wind and heave to for the night, but he decided against it. Went down the companionway and opened the forecastle door. The companionway led into the crew's quarters. The cabin ran the width of the ship, and had bunks and hammock space for a hundred and twenty men. The warmth surrounded him, and he was grateful for it, and ignored the ever-present stench from the bilges below. None of the twenty-odd men moved from his bunk. Get aloft, mate, Zucker," he said in Dutch, the lingua franca of the Low Countries, which he spoke perfectly, along with Portuguese and Spanish and Latin. "I'm near dead," the small, sharp-featured man said. Cringing deeper into the bunk, I'm sick. Look, this scurvy's taken all my teeth. Lord Jesus, help us while、well, all perish. If it wasn't for you, we'd all be home by now, safe. I'm a merchant. I'm not a seaman. I'm not part of the crew. Take someone else. Your hand there. He screamed as Blackthorn jerked him out of the bunk and hurled him against the door. Blood flecked his mouth, and he was stunned. A brutal kick in his side brought him out of his stupor. You get your face aloft and stay there till you're dead, or we make landfall. The man pulled the door open and fled in agony. Blackthorn looked at the others. They stared back at him. How are you feeling, Johann? Good enough, pilot. Perhaps I live. Johann Vink was forty-three, the chief gunner and boatswain's mate, the oldest man aboard. He was hairless and toothless, the colour of aged oak, and just as strong. Six years ago, he'd sailed with Blackthorn on the ill-fated search for the Northeast Passage, and each man knew the measure of the other. At your age, most men are already dead. So you're ahead of us all. Blackthorn was thirty-six. Vink smiled mirthlessly. It's the brandy pilot. That and fornication and the saintly life I've led. No one laughed. Then someone pointed at a bunk. Pilot, the boatswain's dead. Then get the body aloft, wash it, and close his eyes. You, you, and you. The men were quickly out of their bunks this time, and together they half dragged, half carried the corpse from the cabin. Take the dawn watch, Vink, and Gensel, your bow lookout. Yes, sir. Blackthorn went back on deck. He saw that Hendrick was still awake, that the ship was in order. The relieved lookout, Salomon, stumbled past him, more dead than alive. His eyes puffed and red from the cut of the wind. Blackthorn crossed to the other door and went below. The passageway led to the great cabin aft, which was the captain general's quarters and magazine. His own cabin was starboard, and the other to port was usually for the three mates. Now, Bacchus van Neck, the chief merchant, Hendrik, the third mate, and the boy Crook, shared it. They were all very sick. He went into the great cabin. The captain general Paulus Spielbergen was lying half conscious in his bunk. He was a short, florid man, normally very fat, now very thin. The skin of his paunch hanging slackly in folds. Blackthorn took a water flagon out of a secret drawer and helped him drink a little. Thanks, Spielbergen said weakly. Where's land? Where's land? Ahead, he replied, no longer believing it. 
then put the flagon away, closed his ears to the wines, and left, hating him anew. Almost exactly a year ago they'd reached Tierra del Fuego, the winds favourable for the stab into the unknown of Magellan's Pass. But the Captain General had ordered a landing to search for gold and treasure. Christ Jesus, look ashore, Captain General, there's no treasure in those wastes. Legend says it's rich with gold and we can claim the land for the glorious Netherlands. The Spaniards have been here in strength for fifty years. Perhaps, but perhaps not this far south, Pilot Major. This far south, the seasons are reversed. May, June, July, August, a dead winter here. The rutter says the timing's critical to get through the straits. The wind turns in a few weeks, then we'll have to stay here, winter here, for months. How many weeks, Pilot? The rutter says eight, but seasons don't stay the same. Then we'll explore for a couple of weeks. That gives us plenty of time, and then, if necessary, we'll go north again and sack a few more towns, eh, gentlemen? We've got to try now, Captain General. The Spanish have very few warships in the Pacific. Here the seas are teeming with them, and they're looking for us. I say we've got to go on now. But the Captain General had overridden him and put it to a vote of the other captains, not to the other pilots, one English and three Dutch, and had led the useless forays ashore. The winds had changed early that year, and they had had to winter there, the Captain General afraid to go north because of Spanish fleets. It was four months before they could sail. By then, 156 men in the fleet had died of starvation, cold, and the flux, and they were eating the calf skin that covered the ropes. The terrible storms within the strait had scattered the fleet. Erasmus was the only ship that made the rendezvous off Chile. They had waited a month for the others, and then, the Spaniards closing in, had set sail into the unknown. The secret rudder stopped at Chile. Blackthorn walked back along the corridor and unlocked his own cabin door, relocking it behind him. The cabin was low-beamed, small and orderly, and he had to stoop as he crossed to sit at his desk. He unlocked a drawer and carefully unwrapped the last of the apples he had hoarded so carefully all the way from Santa Maria Island, off Chile. It was bruised and tiny, with mould on the rotting section. He cut off a quarter. There were a few maggots inside. He ate them with the flesh, heeding the old sea legend that the apple maggots were just as effective against scurvy as the fruit, and that, rubbed into the gums, they helped prevent your teeth from falling out. He chewed the fruit gently because his teeth were aching and his gums sore and tender, then sipped water from the wineskin. It tasted brackish. Then he wrapped the remainder of the apple and locked it away. A rat scurried in the shadows cast by the hanging oil lantern over his head. Timbers creaked pleasantly. Cockroaches swarmed on the floor. I'm tired. I'm so tired. He glanced at his bunk. Long, narrow, the straw palliasse inviting. I'm so tired. Go to sleep for this hour, the devil half of him said. Even for ten minutes and you'll be fresh for a week. You've had only a few hours for days now, most of that aloft in the cold. You must sleep. Sleep. They rely on you. I won't. I'll sleep tomorrow. He said aloud and forced his hand to unlock his chest and take out his rudder. He saw that the other one, the Portuguese one, was safe and untouched, and that pleased him. He took a clean quill and began to write. April 21st, 1600, fifth hour, dusk, 133rd day from Santa Maria Island, Chile, on the 32 degree north line of latitude. Sea still high and wind strong and the ship rigged as before. The color of the sea dull, gray, green and bottomless. We're still running before the wind along a course of 270 degrees, veering to north-northwest, making way briskly about two leagues, each of three miles this hour. Large reefs, shaped like a triangle, were sighted at half the hour, bearing northeast by north, half a league distant. Three men died in the night of the scurvy. Joris Sailmaker, Rice Gunner, Second Mate Dahan. After commending their souls to God, the Captain General still being sick, I cast them into the sea without shrouds, for there was no one to make them. Today, Boson Raycloff died. I could not take the declension of the sun at noon today, again due to overcast. But I estimate we are still on course and that landfall in the Japan should be soon. But how soon? 
he asked the sea lantern that hung above his head, swaying with the pitch of the ship. How to make a chart? There must be a way, he told himself for the millionth time. How to set longitude? There must be a way. How to keep vegetables fresh? What is scurvy? They say it's a flux from the sea, boy. Alban Caradoc had said. He was a huge-bellied, great-hearted man with a tangled grey beard. But could you boil the vegetables and keep the broth? It sickens, lad. No one's ever discovered a way to store it. They say that Francis Drake sails soon. No, you can't go, boy. I'm almost fourteen. You let Tom and Watt sign on with him and he needs apprentice pilots. There's sixteen. You're just thirteen. They say he's going to try for Magellan's Pass, then up the coast to the unexplored region, to the Californias, to find the Straits of Anian that join Pacific with Atlantic. From the Californias all the way to Newfoundland, the Northwest Passage at long last. The supposed Northwest Passage, lad. No one's proved that legend yet. He will. He's Admiral now, and we'll be the first English ship through Magellan's Pass, the first in the Pacific, the first... Oh, I'll never get another chance like this. Oh, yes, you will. And he'll never breach Magellan's secret way unless he can steal a rudder or capture a Portuguese pilot to guide him through. How many times must I tell you? A pilot must have patience. Learn patience, boy. You plent, please? No. Why? Because he'll be gone two, three years, perhaps more. The weak and the young will get the worst of the food and the least of the water. And of the five ships that go, only his will come back. You'll never survive, boy. Then I'll sign for his ship only. I'm strong. You take me. Listen, boy, I was with Drake in Judith, his fifty-tonner, at San Juan de Ulua, when we and Admiral Hawkins, he was in Minion, when we fought our way out of harbour through the dung-eating Spaniards. We'd been trading slaves from Guinea to the Spanish main. But we had no Spanish license for the trade, and they tricked Hawkins and trapped our fleet. They'd thirteen great ships, we six. We sank three of theirs, and they sank our Swallow, Angel, Caravel, and the Jesus of Lubeck. Oh, yes, Drake fought us out of the trap and brought us home, with eleven men aboard to tell the tale. Hawkins had fifteen, out of four hundred and eight jolly jack tars. Drake is merciless, boy. He wants glory and gold, but only for Drake. And too many men are dead proving it. But I won't die. I'll be one of... No. You're apprenticed for twelve years. You've ten more to go, and then you're free. But until that time, until 1588, you'll learn how to build ships and how to command them. You'll obey Alban Caradoc, master shipwright and pilot and member of Trinity House, or you'll never have a license. And if you don't have a license, you'll never pilot any ship in English waters. You'll never command the quarter deck of any English ship in any waters, because that was good King Harry's law. God rest his soul. It was the great whore, Mary Tudor's law. May her soul burn in hell. It's the Queen's law. May she reign forever. It's England's law and the best sea law that's ever been. Blackthorne remembered how he had hated his master then, and hated Trinity House the monopoly created by Henry VIII in 1514 for the training and licensing of all English pilots and masters, and hated his twelve years of semi-bondage, without which he knew he could never get the one thing in the world he wanted. And he had hated Auburn Caradoc even more when, to everlasting glory, Drake and his hundred-ton sloop, the Golden Hind, had miraculously come back to England after disappearing for three years, the first English ship to circumnavigate the globe bringing with her the richest haul of plunder aboard ever brought back to those shores. An incredible million and a half sterling in gold, silver, spices and plate. That four of the five ships were lost, and eight out of every ten men were lost, and Tim and Watt were lost, and a captured Portuguese pilot had led the expedition for Drake through the Magellan into the Pacific, did not assuage his hatred that Drake had hanged one officer, excommunicated the chaplain Fletcher, and failed to find the Northwest Passage, did not detract from national admiration. The Queen took 50% of the treasure and knighted him. The gentry and merchants who had put up the money for the expedition received 300% profit and pleaded to underwrite his next Corsair voyage. 
and all seamen begged to sail with him because he did get plunder. He did come home. And with their share of the booty, the lucky few who survived were rich for life. I would have survived, Blackthorn told himself. I would. And my share of the treasure then would have been enough to... Rods for old! Reef ahead. He felt the cry at first more than he heard it. Then, mixed with the gale, he heard the wailing scream again. He was out of the cabin and up the companionway onto the quarterdeck, his heart pounding, his throat parched. It was dark night now and pouring, and he was momentarily exulted, for he knew that the canvas rain traps, made so many weeks ago, would soon be full to overflowing. He opened his mouth to the near horizontal rain and tasted its sweetness, then turned his back on the squall. He saw that Hendrick was paralysed with terror. The bow lookout, Maitsuka, cowered near the brow, shouting incoherently, pointing ahead. Then he, too, looked beyond the ship. The reef was barely two hundred yards ahead, great black claws of rocks pounded by the hungry sea. The foaming line of surf stretched port and starboard, broken intermittently. The gale was lifting huge swathes of spume and hurling them at the night blackness. A four-peak halyard snapped, and the highest topgallant spar was carried away. The mast shuddered in its bed, but held, and the sea bore the ship inexorably to its death. All hands on deck, Blackthorn shouted, and rang the bell violently. The noise brought Hendrick out of his stupor. We lost, he screamed in Dutch. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us! Get the crew on deck, you bastard! You've been asleep, you've both been asleep! Blackthorn shoved him toward the companionway, held on to the wheel, slipped the protecting lashing from the spokes, braced himself, and swung the wheel hard a port. He exerted all his strength as the rudder bit into the torrent. The whole ship shuddered. Then the prow began to swing with increasing velocity as the wind bore down, and soon they were broadside to the sea and the wind. The storm topsails bellied and gamely tried to carry the weight of the ship, and all the ropes took the strain, howling. The following sea towered above them, and they were making way parallel to the reef. When he saw the great wave, he shouted a warning at the men who were coming from the forecastle and hung on for his life. The sea fell on the ship, and she heeled, and he thought they'd floundered, but she shook herself like a wet terrier and swung out of the trough. Water cascaded away through the scuppers, and he gasped for air. He saw that the corpse of the bosun that had been put on deck for burial tomorrow was gone, and that the following wave was coming in even stronger. It caught Hendrick and lifted him, gasping and struggling, over the side and out to sea. Another wave roared across the deck, and Blackthorn locked one arm through the wheel, and the water passed him by. Now Hendrick was fifty yards to port. The wash sucked him back alongside. Then a giant coma threw him high above the ship, held him there for a moment, shrieking, then took him away and pulped him against a rock spine and consumed him. The ship nosed into the sea, trying to make way. Another halyard gave, and the block and tackle swung wildly until it tangled with the rigging. Fink and another man pulled themselves under the quarter deck and leaned on the wheel to help. Blackthorn could see the encroaching reef to starboard, nearer now. Ahead and to port were more outcrops, but he saw gaps here and there. Get enough, Fink. Forsles ho! Foot by foot, Fink and two seamen hauled themselves into the shrouds of the foremast rigging, as others below leaned on the ropes to give them a hand. Watch out for it! Blackthorn shouted. The sea foamed along the deck and took another man with it, and brought the corpse of the bosun aboard again. The bow soared out of the water and smashed down once more, bringing more water aboard. Fink and the other men cursed the sail out of its ropes. Abruptly, it fell open, cracked like a cannonade as the wind filled it, and the ship lurched. Fink and his helpers hung there, swaying over the sea. Then began their descent. Reef, reef ahead! Fink screamed. Blackthorn and the other man swung the wheel to starboard. The ship hesitated, then turned and cried out, as the rocks, barely awash, found the side of the ship. But it was an oblique blow, and the rock nose crumbled. The timbers held safe, and the men aboard began to breathe once more. Blackthorn saw a break in the reef ahead and committed the ship to it. The wind was harder now, the sea more furious. The ship swerved with a gust, and the wheel spun out of their hands. 
Together they grabbed it and set her course again, but she bobbed and twisted drunkenly. Sea flooded aboard and burst into the forecastle, smashing one man against the bulkhead. The whole deck awash like the one above. Man the pumps! Blackthorn shouted. He saw two men go below. The rain was slashing his face, and he squinted against the pane. The binnacle light and aft riding light had long since been extinguished. Then, as another gust shoved the ship farther off course, the seamen slipped, and again the wheel spun out of their grasp. The man shrieked as a spoke smashed the side of his head, and he lay there at the mercy of the sea. Blackthorn pulled him up and held him until the frothing coma had passed. Then he saw that the man was dead, so he let him slump into the sea chair, and the next sea cleaned the quarter deck off him. The gulch through the reef was three points to windward, and try as he could, Blackthorn could not gain way. He searched desperately for another channel, but knew there was none. So he let her fall off from the wind momentarily to gain speed, then swung her hard to windward again. She gained way a fraction and held course. There was a wailing, tormented shudder as the keel scraped the razor's spines below, and all aboard imagined they saw the oak timbers burst apart and the sea flood in. The ship reeled forward out of control now. Blackthorn shouted for help, but no one heard him, so he fought the wheel alone against the sea. Once he was flung aside, but he groped back and held on again, wondering in his thickening mind how the rudder had survived so long. In the neck of the pass, the sea became a maelstrom, driven by the tempest and hemmed in by the rocks. Huge waves smashed at the reef, then reeled back to fight the incomer, until the waves fought among themselves and attacked on all quarters of the compass. The ship was sucked into the vortex, broadside and helpless. Piss on you, Storm! Blackthorn raged. Get your dung-eating hands off my ship! The wheel spun again and threw him away, and the deck heeled sickeningly. The bowsprit caught a rock and tore loose part of the rigging with it, and she righted herself. The foremast was bending like a bow, and it snapped. The men on deck fell on the rigging with axes to cut it adrift, as the ship floundered down the raging channel. They hacked the mast free, and it went over the side, and one man went with it, caught in the tangled mess. The man cried out, trapped. But there was nothing they could do, and they watched as he and the mast appeared and disappeared alongside, then came back no more. Vink and the others who were left looked back at the quarter deck and saw Blackthorn defying the storm like a madman. They crossed themselves and doubled their prayers, some weeping with fear, and hung on for life. The strait broadened for an instant, and the ship slowed. But ahead, it narrowed ominously again, and the rocks seemed to grow, to tower over them. The current ricocheted off one side, taking the ship with it, turned her abeam again, and flung her to her doom. Blackthorn stopped, cursing the storm, and fought the wheel to port, and hung there, his muscles knotted against the strain. But the ship knew not her rudder, and neither did the sea. Turn you whore from hell! He gasped. His strength ebbing fast. Help me! The sea race quickened, and he felt his heart near bursting. But still, he strained against the press of the sea. He tried to keep his eyes focused, but his vision reeled. The colours wrong and fading. The ship was in the neck and dead. But just then, the keel scraped a mud shoal. The shock turned her head. The rudder bit into the sea, and then the wind and the sea joined to help. And together they spun her before the wind, and she sped through the pass to safety, into the bay beyond. Book one, chapter one. Blackthorn was suddenly awake. For a moment he thought he was dreaming because he was ashore, and the room unbelievable. It was small and very clean and covered with soft mats. He was lying on a thick quilt, and another was thrown over him. The ceiling was polished cedar, and the walls were laths of cedar in squares, covered with an opaque paper that muted the light pleasantly. Beside him was a scarlet tray bearing small bowls. One contained cold cooked vegetables, and he wolfed them, hardly noticing the piquant taste. Another contained a fish soup, and he drained that. Another was filled with a thick porridge of wheat or barley, and he finished it quickly, eating with his fingers. The water in an odd-shaped gourd was warm and tasted curious, slightly bitter but savoury. 
Then he noticed a crucifix in its niche. This house is Spanish or Portuguese. He thought he cast. Is this the Japan's or Cathay? A panel of the wall slid open. A middle-aged, heavy-set, round-faced woman was on her knees beside the door, and she bowed and smiled. Her skin was golden, and her eyes black and narrow, and her long black hair was piled neatly on her head. She wore a grey silk robe and short white socks with a thick sole, and a wide purple band around her waist. Goshujin sama koki bunwa ikaga desuka, she said. She waited as he stared at her blankly, then said it again. "Is this the Japan's?" he asked. "Japan's or Cathay?" She stared at him uncomprehendingly and said something else he could not understand. Then he realized that he was naked. His clothes were nowhere in sight. With sign language, he showed her that he wanted to get dressed. Then he pointed at the food bowls, and she knew that he was still hungry. She smiled and bowed. And slid the door shut. He lay back exhausted, the untoward, nauseating non-motion of the floor, making his head spin. With an effort, he tried to collect himself. I remember getting the anchor out. He thought, "With Fink, I think it was Fink. We were in a bay, and the ship had nosed a shoal and stopped. We could hear waves breaking on the beach, but everything was safe. There were lights ashore, and then I was in my cabin in blackness. I don't remember anything." And there were lights through the blackness and strange voices. I was talking English, then Portuguese. One of the natives talked a little Portuguese, or was he Portuguese? No, I think he was a native. Did I ask him where we were? I don't remember. Then we were back in the reef again, and the big wave came once more, and I was carried out to sea and drowning. It was freezing. No, the sea was warm and like a silk bed, a fathom thick. They must have carried me ashore and put me here. It must have been this bed that felt so soft and warm," he said aloud. "I've never slept on silk before." His weakness overcame him, and he slept dreamlessly. When he awoke, there was more food in earthenware bowls, and his clothes were beside him in a neat pile. They'd been washed and pressed and mended with tiny, exquisite stitching. But his knife was gone, and so were his keys. "I'd better get a knife and quickly," he thought. Or a pistol. His eyes went to the crucifix. In spite of his dread, his excitement quickened. All his life, he had heard legends told among pilots and sailor men about the incredible riches of Portugal's secret empire in the east, how they had by now converted the heathens to Catholicism, and so held them in bondage, where gold was as cheap as pig iron, and emeralds, rubies, diamonds, and sapphires as plentiful as pebbles on a beach. If the Catholic part's true. He told himself, "Perhaps the rest is too, about the riches. Yes, but the sooner I'm armed and back aboard Erasmus and behind her cannon, the better." He consumed the food, dressed, and stood shakily, feeling out of his element, as he always did ashore. His boots were missing. He went to the door, reeling slightly, and put out a hand to steady himself, but the light square lathes could not bear his weight, and they shattered, the paper ripping apart. He righted himself. The shocked woman in the corridor was staring up at him. "I'm sorry," he said, strangely ill at ease with his clumsiness. The purity of the room was somehow defiled. "Where are my boots?" The woman stared at him blankly. So patiently he asked her again with sign language, and she hurried down a passage, knelt, and opened another lath door and beckoned him. Voices were nearby, and the sound of running water. He went through the doorway and found himself in another room, also almost bare. This opened onto a veranda with steps leading to a small garden surrounded by a high wall. Beside this main entrance were two old women, three children dressed in scarlet robes, and an old man, obviously a gardener, with a rake in his hand. At once, they all bowed gravely and kept their heads low. To his astonishment, Blackthorn saw that the old man was naked. But for a brief, narrow loincloth, hardly covering his organs. Morning, he said to them, not knowing what to say. They stayed motionless, still bowing. Nonplussed, he stared at them. Then awkwardly, he bowed back to them. They all straightened and smiled at him. The old man bowed once more and went back to work in the garden. 
The children stared at him, then laughing, dashed away. The old women disappeared into the depths of the house, but he could feel their eyes on him. He saw his boots at the bottom of the steps. Before he could pick them up, the middle-aged woman was there on her knees, to his embarrassment, and she helped him to put them on. Thank you, he said. He thought a moment and then pointed at himself. Black thorn, he said deliberately. Black thorn. Then he pointed at her. What's your name? She stared at him uncomprehendingly. Black thorn, he repeated carefully, pointing at himself and again pointed at her. What's your name? She frowned. Then, with a flood of understanding, pointed at herself and said, "Anna, Anna, Anna." He repeated, very proud of himself as she was with herself, "Anna." She nodded happily, "Anna." The garden was unlike anything he'd ever seen: a little waterfall and stream, and small bridge, and manicured pebbled paths, and rocks, and flowers, and shrubs. It's so clean, he thought, so neat. Incredible," he said. "Nicaribar," she repeated helpfully. "Nothing," he said. Then, not knowing what else to do, he waved her away. Obediently, she bowed politely and left. Blackthorn sat in the warm sun, leaning against a post. Feeling very frail, he watched the old man weeding an already weedless garden. "I wonder where the others are. Is the Captain General still alive?" How many days have I been asleep? I can remember waking and eating and sleeping again. The eating unsatisfactory, like the dreams. The children flurried past, chasing one another, and he was embarrassed for them at the gardener's nakedness. For when the man bent over or stooped, you could see everything, and he was astounded that the children appeared not to notice. He saw tiled and thatched roofs of other buildings over the wall, and far off high mountains. A crisp wind broomed the sky and kept the cumulus advancing. Bees were foraging, and it was a lovely spring day. His body begged for more sleep, but he pushed himself erect and went to the garden door. The gardener smiled and bowed and ran to open the door and bowed and closed it after him. The village was set around the crescent harbour that faced east. Perhaps two hundred houses. Unlike any he'd ever seen, nestling at the beginning of the mountain, which spilled down to the shore. Above were terraced fields and dirt roads that led north and south. Below, the waterfront was cobbled, and a stone launching ramp went from the shore into the sea. A good safe harbour and a stone jetty, and men and women cleaning fish and making nets. A uniquely designed boat being built at the northern side. There were islands far out to sea. To the east and to the south, the reefs would be there or beyond the horizon. In the harbour were many other quaintly shaped boats, mostly fishing craft, some with one large sail, several being sculled, the oars men standing and pushing against the sea, not sitting and pulling as he would have done. A few of the boats were heading out to sea; others were nosing at the wooden dock. And Erasmus was anchored neatly fifty yards from shore in good water, with three bow cables. Who did that? He asked himself. There were boats alongside her, and he could see native men aboard, but none of his. Where could they be? He looked around the village and became conscious of the many people watching him. When they saw that he had noticed them, they all bowed, and still uncomfortable, he bowed back. Once more, there was happy activity, and they passed to and fro, stopping, bargaining, bowing to each other, seemingly oblivious of him, like so many multicolored butterflies. But he felt eyes studying him from every window and doorway as he walked towards the shore. What is it about them that's so weird? He asked himself. It's not just their clothes and behavior; it's they've no weapons. He thought, astounded, no swords or guns. Why is that? Open shops filled with odd goods and bales lined the small street. The floors of the shops were raised, and the sellers and the buyers knelt or squatted on the clean wooden floors. He saw that most had clogs or rush sandals, some with the same white socks with a thick sole that was split between the big toe and the next to hold the thongs. 
but they left the clogs and sandals outside in the dirt. Those who were barefoot cleansed their feet and slipped on clean indoor sandals that were waiting for them. That's very sensible if you think about it, he told himself, awed. Then he saw the tonsured man approaching, and fear swept sickeningly from his testicles into his stomach. The priest was obviously Portuguese or Spanish, and though his flowing robe was orange, there was no mistaking the rosary and crucifix at his belt, or the cold hostility on his face. His robe was travel-stained, and his European-style boots besmirched with mud. He was looking out into the harbour at Erasmus, and Blackthorn knew that he must recognise her as Dutch or English, new to most seas, leaner, faster, a merchant fighting ship, patterned and improved on the English privateers that had wreaked so much havoc on the Spanish main. With the priest were ten natives, black-haired and black-eyed, one dressed like him except that he had thong slippers. The others wore vari-coloured robes or loose trousers or simply loincloths, but none was armed. Blackthorn wanted to run while there was time, but he knew he did not have the strength, and there was nowhere to hide. His height and size and the colour of his eyes made him alien in this world. He put his back against the wall. Who are you? the priest said in Portuguese. He was a thick, dark, well-fed man in his middle twenties with a long beard. Who are you? Blackthorn stared back at him. That's a Netherland privateer. You're a heretic Dutchman. You're pirates. God have mercy on you. We're not pirates. We're peaceful merchants. Except to our enemies. I'm pilot of that ship. Who are you? Father Sebastio. How did you get here? How? We were blown ashore. What is this place? Is it the Japans? Yes. Japan. Nippon. The priest said impatiently. He turned to one of the men, older than the rest. Small and lean, with strong arms and calloused hands his pate shaved and his hair drawn into a thin queue, as grey as his eyebrows. The priest spoke haltingly to him in Japanese, pointing at Blackthorn. All of them were shocked, and one made the sign of the cross protectively. Dutchmen are heretics, rebels and pirates. What's your name? Is this a Portuguese settlement? The priest's eyes were hard and bloodshot. The village headman says he's told the authorities about you. Your sins have caught up with you. Where's the rest of your crew? We were blown off course. We just need food and water and time to repair our ship. Then we'll be off. We can pay for every... Where's the rest of your crew? I don't know. Aboard. I suppose they're aboard. Again, the priest questioned the head man, who replied and motioned to the other end of the village, explaining at length. The priest turned back to Blackthorn. They crucify criminals here, pilot. You're going to die. The daimyo is coming with his samurai. God have mercy on you. What's a daimyo? A feudal lord. He owns this whole province. How did you get here? And samurai? Warriors, soldiers, members of the warrior caste. The priest said with growing irritation. Where did you come from and who are you? I don't recognize your accent. Blackthorn said to throw him off balance. You're a Spaniard? I'm Portuguese, the priest flared, taking the bait. I told you, I'm Father Sebastio from Portugal. Where did you learn such good Portuguese, eh? But Portugal and Spain are the same country now, Blackthorn said, taunting. You've the same king. We're a separate country. We're a different people. We have been forever. We fly our own flag. Our overseas possessions are separate? Yes, separate. King Philip agreed when he stole my country. Father Sebastio controlled his temper with an effort, his fingers trembling. He took my country by force of arms twenty years ago. His soldiers and that devil-spawned Spaniard tyrant, the Duke of Alba, they crushed our real king, Keva. Now Philip's son rules, but he's not our real king either. Soon we'll have our own king back again. Then he added with venom, You know, it's the truth. What devil Alva did to your country, he did to mine. That's a lie. Alva was a plague in the Netherlands, but he never conquered them. They're still free. Always will be. But in Portugal, he smashed one small army and the whole country gave in. No courage. You could throw the Spaniard out if you wanted to, but you'll never do it. No honor. No cojones. Except to burn innocents in the name of God. 
May God burn you in hellfire for all eternity. The priest flared. Satan walks abroad and will be stamped out. Heretics will be stamped out. You are cursed before God. In spite of himself, Blackthorn felt the religious terror begin to rise within him. Priests don't have the ear of God or speak with his voice. We're free of your stinking yoke and we're going to stay free. It was only forty years ago that Bloody Mary Tudor was Queen of England and the Spaniard Philip II, Philip the Cruel, her husband. This deeply religious daughter of Henry VIII had brought back Catholic priests and inquisitors and heresy trials and the dominance of the foreign pope again to England and had reversed her father's curbs and historic changes to the Church of Rome in England against the will of the majority. She'd ruled for five years, and the realm was torn asunder with hatred and fear and bloodshed. But she died, and Elizabeth became queen at twenty-four. Blackthorn was filled with wonder and deep filial love when he thought of Elizabeth. For forty years she's battled with the world. She's outfoxed and outfought popes, the Holy Roman Empire, France and Spain combined. Excommunicated, spat on, reviled abroad... She's led us into harbour, safe, strong, separate. We're free, Blackthorn said to the priest. You're broken. We've our own schools now, our own books, our own Bible, our own church. You Spaniards are all the same awful. You monks are all the same idol worshippers. The priest lifted his crucifix and held it between Blackthorn and himself as a shield. Oh, God, protect us from this evil. I'm not Spanish, I tell you, I'm Portuguese. And I'm not a monk, I'm a brother of the Society of Jesus. Ah, one of them, a Jesuit. Yes, may God have mercy on your soul. Father Sebastio snapped something in Japanese and the men surged toward Blackthorn. He backed against the wall and hit one man hard, but the others swarmed over him and he felt himself choking. Nani kotoda? Abruptly the Malay ceased. The young man was ten paces away. He wore breeches and clogs and a light kimono, and two scabbarded swords were stuck into his belt. One was dagger-like. The other, a two-handed killing sword, was long and slightly curved. His right hand was casually on the hilt. Nani kotoda? he asked harshly. And when no one answered instantly, Nani kotoda? The Japanese fell to their knees, their heads bowed into the dirt. Only the priest stayed on his feet. He bowed and began to explain haltingly, but the man contemptuously cut him short and pointed at the headman. Mura! Mura, the headman, kept his head bowed and began explaining rapidly. Several times he pointed at Blackthorn, once at the ship and twice at the priest. Now there was no movement on the street. All who were visible were on their knees and bowing low. The headman finished. The armed man arrogantly questioned him for a moment, and he was answered deferentially and quickly. Then the soldier said something to the headman and waved with open contempt at the priest. Then at Blackthorn, and the grey haired man put it more simply to the priest, who flushed. The man, who was a head shorter and much younger than Blackthorn, his handsome face slightly pockmarked, stared at the stranger. Omushi itai doko karat kitanoda. Doko no kuni no monoda. The priest said nervously, Kasigi Omi san says, Where do you come from and what's your nationality? Is Mr. Omi san the daimyo? Blackthorn asked, afraid of the swords in spite of himself. No, he's a samurai, the samurai in charge of the village. His surname's Kasigi. Omi's his given name. Here they always put their surnames first. Son means honorable, and you add it to all names as a politeness. You'd better learn to be polite, and find some manners quickly. Here they don't tolerate lack of manners. His voice edged. Hurry up and answer. Amsterdam, I'm English. Father Sebastian's shock was open. He said, English, England to the samurai, and began an explanation, but Omi impatiently cut him short and rapped out a flurry of words. Omi-san asks if you're the leader. The headman says there are only a few of you heretics alive and most are sick. 
Is there a captain general? I'm the leader, Blackthorn answered, even though truly, now that they were ashore, the captain general was in command. I'm in command, he added, knowing that Captain General Spielbergen could command nothing ashore or afloat, even when he was fit and well. Another spate of words from the samurai. Omi-san says because you are the leader you are allowed to walk around the village freely, wherever you want, until his master comes. His master, the daimyo, will decide your fate. Until then you are permitted to live as a guest in the headman's house and come and go as you please. But you are not to leave the village. Your crew are confined to their house and are not allowed to leave it. Do you understand? Yes. Where are my crew? Father Sebastio pointed vaguely at a cluster of houses near a wharf, obviously distressed by Omi's decision and impatience. There, enjoy your freedom, pirate. Your evil's caught up with... Wakari Masukan, Omi said directly to Blackthorn. He says, do you understand? What's yes in Japanese? Father Sebastio said to the samurai, Wakari Masu. Omi disdainfully waved them away. They all bowed low, except one man who rose deliberately, without bowing. With blinding speed, the killing sword made a hissing silver arc, and the man's head toppled off his shoulders, and a fountain of blood sprayed the earth. The body rippled a few times and was still. Involuntarily, the priest had backed off a pace. No one else in the street had moved a muscle, their heads remained low and motionless. Blackthorn was rigid in shock. Omi put his foot carelessly on the corpse. Ikinazai, he said, motioning them away. The men in front of him bowed again to the earth. Then they got up and went away impassively. The street began to empty, and the shops. Father Sebastio looked down at the body. Gravely, he made the sign of the cross over him and said... In nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti. He stared back at the samurai without fear now. Ikinisai! The tip of the gleaming sword rested on the body. After a long moment, the priest turned and walked away with dignity. Omi watched him narrowly, then glanced at Blackthorn. Blackthorn backed away and then, when safely distant, he quickly turned a corner and vanished. Omi began to laugh uproariously. The street was empty now. When his laughter was exhausted, he grasped his sword with both hands and began to hack the body methodically into small pieces. Blackthorn was in a small boat, the boatman sculling happily toward Erasmus. He had had no trouble in getting the boat, and he could see men on the main deck. All were samurai. Some had steel breastplates, but most wore simple kimonos, as the robes were called, and the two swords. All wore their hair the same way, the top of the head shaved, and the hair at the back and sides gathered into a queue, oiled, then doubled over the crown and tied neatly. Only samurai were allowed this style, and for them it was obligatory. Only samurai could wear the two swords, always the long two-handed killing sword, and the short dagger-like one and for them the swords were obligatory. The samurai lined the gunnels of his ship, watching him. Filled with disquiet, he climbed up the gangway and came on deck. One samurai, more elaborately dressed than the others, came over to him and bowed. Blackthorn had learned well, and he bowed back equally, and everyone on the deck beamed genially. He still felt the horror of the sudden killing in the street, and their smiles did not allay his foreboding. He went toward the companionway, and stopped abruptly. Across the doorway was pasted a wide band of red silk, and beside it a small sign with queer, squiggled writing. He hesitated, checked the other door, but that too was sealed up with a similar band, and a similar sign was nailed to the bulkhead. He reached out to remove the silk. Ote, okay. To make the point quite clear, the samurai on guard shook his head. He was no longer smiling. But this is my ship, and I want... Blackthorn bottled his anxiety. Eyes on the swords. I've got to get below, he thought. 
I've got to get the rutters, mine and the secret one. Christ Jesus, if they're found and given to the priests or the Japaners, we're finished. Any court in the world, outside of England and the Netherlands, would convict us as pirates with that evidence. My rusher gives dates, places and amounts of plunder taken, the number of dead at our three landings in the Americas, and the one in Spanish Africa, the number of churches sacked, and how we burned the towns and the shipping. And the Portuguese rutter, that's our death warrant, for of course it's stolen. At least it was bought from a Portuguese traitor, and by their law any foreigner caught in possession of any rutter of theirs, let alone one that unlocks the Magellan, is to be put to death at once. And if the rutter is found aboard an enemy ship, the ship is to be burned, and all aboard executed without mercy. None know your da, one of the samurai said. Do you speak Portuguese? Blackthorn asked in that language. The man shrugged. Wakari Masen. Another came forward and deferentially spoke to the leader, who nodded in agreement. Portuguese, old friend, this samurai said in heavily accented Portuguese. He opened the top of his kimono and showed the small wooden crucifix that hung from his neck. Christan, he pointed at himself and smiled. Christan, he pointed at Blackthorn. Christan Ka. Blackthorn hesitated, nodded. Christian. Portuguese or English? The man chatted with the leader, then both shrugged and looked back at him. Portuguese or Blackthorn shook his head, not liking to disagree with them on anything. My friends, where? The samurai pointed to the east end of the village. Friends, this is my ship. I want to go below. Blackthorn said it in several ways and with signs, and they understood. Ah, so de so, Kinjiro, they said emphatically, indicating the notice, and beamed. It was quite clear that he was not allowed to go below. Kinjiro must mean forbidden, Blackthorn thought irritably. Well, to hell with that. He snapped the handle of the door down and opened it a fraction. Kinjiro! He was jerked around to face the samurai. Their swords were half out of the scabbards. Motionlessly, the two men waited for him to make up his mind. Others on deck watched impassively. Blackthorn knew he had no option but to back down, so he shrugged and walked away and checked the hawsers and the ship as best he could. The tattered sails were down and tied in place, but the lashings were different from any he'd ever seen, so he presumed that the Japaners had made the vessel secure. He started down the gangway and stopped. He felt the cold sweat as he saw them all staring at him malevolently, and he thought, Christ Jesus, how could I be so stupid? He bowed politely, and at once the hostility vanished, and they all bowed and were smiling again. But he could still feel the sweat trickling down his spine, and he hated everything about the Japans, and wished himself and his crew back aboard, armed and out to sea. By the Lord Jesus, I think you're wrong, pilot, Fink said. His toothless grin was wide and obscene. If you can put up with the swill decor food, it's the best place I've been ever. I've had two women in three days and they're like rabbits. They'd do anything if you show them how. That's right, but you can't do nothing without meat or brandy. Not for long. I'm tired out and I could only do it once. Mate Suka said, his narrow face twitching. The yellow bastards won't understand that we need meat and beer and bread and brandy or wine. That's the worst. Lord Jesus, my kingdom for some grog. Bacchus Van Neck was filled with gloom. He walked over and stood close to Blackthorn and peered up at him. He was very nearsighted and lost his last pair of spectacles in the storm. But even with them, he'd always stand as close as possible. He was chief merchant, treasurer, and representative of the Dutch East India Company that had put up the money for the voyage. We are sure and safe, and I haven't had a drink yet. Not a beautiful drop. Terrible. Did you get any pilot? No. Blackthorn disliked having anyone near him, but Bacchus was a friend and almost blind, so he did not move away. Just hot water with herbs in it. They simply won't understand, Krog. Nothing to drink but hot water and herbs. The good Lord help us. Suppose there's no liquor in the whole country? His eyebrows soared. Do me a huge favor, pilot. Ask for some liquor, will you? Blackthorn found the house that they'd been assigned on the eastern edge of the village. The samurai guard had let him pass, 
but his men had confirmed that they themselves could not go out of the garden gate. The house was many-roomed, like his, but bigger and staffed with many servants of various ages, both men and women. There were eleven of his men alive. The dead had been taken away by the Japanese. Lavish portions of fresh vegetables had begun to banish the scurvy, and all but two of the men were healing rapidly. These two had blood in their bowels, and their insides were fluxed. Vink had bled them, but this had not helped. By nightfall, he expected them to die. The Captain General was in another room, still very sick. Sunk, the cook, a stocky little man, was saying with a laugh, It's good here, like Johan says, pilot, excepting the food and no grog. And it's all right with the natives so long as you don't wear your shoes in their house. It sends the little yellow bastards mad if you don't take off your shoes. Listen, Blackthorn said, there's a priest here, a Jesuit. Christ Jesus! All banter left them as he told them about the priest and about the beheading. Why did he chop the man's head off, pilot? I don't know. We'd better get back aboard if papists catch us ashore. There was great fear in the room now. Salomon, the mute, watched Blackthorn. His mouth worked, a bubble of phlegm appearing at the corners. No, Salomon, there's no mistake. Blackthorn said kindly, answering the silent question. He said he was Jesuit. Christ, Jesuit or Dominican or what the hell ever makes no muck-eating difference, Fink said. We'd better get back aboard. Pilot, you ask that samurai, eh? We in God's hands, Jan Roper said. He was one of the merchant adventurers, a narrow-eyed young man with a high forehead and thin nose. He will protect us from the Satan worshippers. Vink looked back at Blackthorn. What about Portuguese, pilot? Did you see any around? No, there were no signs of them in the village. They'll swarm here soon as they know about us. Metsuka said it for all of them, and the boy Croak let out a moan. Yes, and if there's one priest, there's got to be others. Ginsel licked dry lips. And then their god-cursed conquistadores are never far away. That's right, Vink added uneasily. They're like lice. Christ Jesus, papists, someone muttered, and conquistadores. But we're in the Japans, pilot? Van Neck asked. He told you that? Yes, why? Van Neck moved closer and dropped his voice. If priests are here and some of the natives are Catholic, perhaps the other part's true about the riches, the gold and silver and precious stones? A harsh fell on them. Did you see any, pilot? Any gold? Any gems on the natives or gold? No, none. Blackthorn thought a moment. I don't remember seeing any. No necklaces or beads or bracelets. Listen, there's something else to tell you. I went aboard Erasmus, but she sealed up. He related what had happened, and their anxiety increased. Jesus, if we can't go back aboard and our priests ashore and papists, we've got to get away from here. Maitsuka's voice began to tremble. Pilot, what are we going to do? They'll burn us, conquistadores. Those bastards will shove their swords. We're in God's hands, Jan Roper called out confidently. He will protect us from the Antichrist. That's his promise. There's nothing to be afraid of. Blackthorn said, The way the samurai Omi-san snarled at the priest. I'm sure he hated him. Well, that's good, eh? What I'd like to know is why the priest wasn't wearing their usual robes. Why the orange one? I've never seen that before. Yes, that's curious, Van Neck said. Blackthorn looked up at him. Maybe their hold here isn't strong. That could help us greatly. What should we do, pilot? Kinsel asked. Be patient and wait till their chief, this daimyo, comes. He let us go. Why shouldn't he? We've done them no harm. We've goods to trade. We're not pirates. We're nothing to fear. Very true. And don't forget the pilot said the savages aren't all papists. Van Neck said, more to encourage himself than the others. Yes, it's good the samurai hated the priest. And it's only the samurai who are armed. That's not so bad, eh? Just watch out for the samurai and get our weapons back. That's the idea. We'll be aboard for you know it. What happens if the daimyo's papist? Jan Roper asked. No one answered him. Then Kinsel said, Pilot, the man with the sword, he cut the other wog into pieces after chopping his head off. Yes. Christ, 
They're barbarians, lunatics. Ginsel was tall, a good-looking youth with short arms and very bowed legs. The scurvy had taken all his teeth. After he chopped his head off, the others just walked away without saying anything. Yes, Christ Jesus, an unarmed man, murdered just like that. Why'd he do it? Why'd he kill him? I don't know, Ginsel, but you've never seen such speed. One moment the sword was sheathed, the next the man's head was rolling. God protect us. Dear Lord Jesus, Van Neck murmured, if we can't get back to the ship, God damn that storm, I feel so helpless without my spectacles. How many samurai were aboard, pilot? Ginsel asked. Twenty-two were on deck, but there were more ashore. The wrath of God will be upon the heathen and on sinners, and they'll burn in hell for all eternity. I'd like to be sure of that, Jan Roper, Blackthorn said, an edge to his voice, as he felt the fear of God's vengeance sweep through the room. He was very tired and wanted to sleep. You can be sure, pilot. Oh, yes, I am. I pray that your eyes are open to God's truth, that you come to realize we are here only because of you, what's left of us. What? Blackthorn said dangerously. Why did you really persuade the Captain General to try for the Japans? It wasn't in our orders. We were to pillage the new world, to carry the war into the enemy's belly, then go home. There were Spanish ships south and north of us, and nowhere else to run. Is your memory gone along with your wits? We had to sail west. It was our only chance. I never saw enemy ships, pilot. None of us did. Come now, Jan, Van Neck said wearily. The pilot did what he thought best. Of course, the Spaniards were there. Aye, that's the truth. And we was a thousand leagues from friends and in enemy waters, by God. Fink spat. That's the God's truth. And the God's truth was we put it to a vote. We all said yes. I didn't. Sonk said, no one asked me. Oh, Christ Jesus. Calm down, Johann. Van Neck said, trying to ease the tension. We're the first ones to reach the Japans. Remember all the stories, eh? We're rich if we keep our wits. We have trade goods and there's gold here. There must be. Where else could we sell our cargo? Not there in the New World, hunted and harried. They were hunting us, and the Spaniards knew we were off Santa Maria. We had to quit Chile, and there was no escape back through the strait. Of course they'd be lying in wait for us. Of course they would. No, here was our only chance, and a good idea. Our cargo exchanged for spices and gold and silver, eh? Think of the profit, a thousandfold, that's usual. We're in the Spice Islands. You know the riches of the Japans and Cathay. You've heard about them forever. We all have. Why else did we all sign on? We'll be rich, you'll see. We're dead men like all the others. We're in the land of Satan. Fink said angrily, Shut your mouth, Roper. The pilot did right. Not his fault the others died. Not his fault. Men always die on these voyages. Jan Roper's eyes were flecked, the pupils tiny. Yes, God rest their souls. My brother was one. Blackthorn looked into the fanatic eyes, hating Jan Roper. Inside he was asking himself if he'd really sailed west to elude the enemy ships. Or was it because he was the first English pilot through the strait? First in position, ready and able to stab west, and therefore first with a chance of circumnavigating. Jan Roper hissed, Didn't the others die through your ambition, pilot? God will punish you. Now hold your tongue. Blackthorn's words were soft and final. Jan Roper stared back with the same frozen hatchet face, but he kept his mouth shut. Good. Blackthorn sat tiredly on the floor and rested against one of the uprights. What should we do, pilot? Wait and get fit. Their chief is coming soon, then we'll get everything settled. Fink was looking out into the garden at the samurai who sat motionless on his heels beside the gateway. Look at that bastard. Been there for hours, never moves, never says anything, doesn't even pick his nose. He's been no trouble, though, Johan, none at all, Van Neck said. Yes, but all we've been doing is sleeping and fornicating and eating this fill. Pilot, he's only one man. We're ten, Ginsel said quietly. I've thought of that, but we're not fit enough yet. It'll take a week for the scurvy to go. Blackthorn replied, disquieted. There are too many of them aboard ship. 
I wouldn't like to take on even one without a spear or gun. Are you guarded at night? Yes, they change guard three or four times. Has anyone seen a sentry asleep? Van Neck asked. They shook their heads. We could be aboard tonight, Jan Roper said. With the help of God, we'll overpower the heathen and take the ship. Clear this shit out of your ears. The pilots just got through telling you. Don't you listen? Vink spat disgustedly. That's right, Peter Zone, a gunner, agreed. Stop hacking at old Vink. Jan Roper's eyes narrowed even more. Look to your soul, Johan Vink, and yours, Hans Peterson. The day of judgment approaches. He walked away and sat on the veranda. Van Neck broke the silence. Everything's going to be all right, you'll see. Roper's right. It's greed that put us here, the boy Croak said, his voice quavering. It's God's punishment that... Stop it, the boy jerked. Yes, pilot. Sorry, but... Well... Maximilian Croak was the youngest of them, just sixteen, and he'd signed on for the voyage because his father had been captain of one of the ships, and they were going to make their fortune. But he'd seen his father die badly when they'd sacked the Spanish town of Santa Magdalena in the Argentine. The plunder had been good, and he'd seen what rape was, and he'd tried it, hating himself, glutted by the blood smell and the killing. Later he'd seen more of his friends die, and the five ships become one, and now he felt he was the oldest among them. Sorry, I'm sorry. How long have we been ashore, Bacchus? Blackthorn asked. This is the third day. Van Neck moved close again, squatting on his haunches. Don't remember the arrival too clearly, but when I woke up the savages were all over the ship, very polite and kind, though, gave us food and hot water. They took the dead away and put the anchors out. Don't remember much, but I think they towed us to a safe mooring. You were delirious when they carried you ashore. We wanted to keep you with us, but they wouldn't let us. One of them spoke a few words in Portuguese. He seemed to be head man. He had gray hair. He didn't understand pilot major, but new captain. It was quite clear he wanted our captain to have different quarters from us. But he said we shouldn't worry because you'd be well looked after. Us too. Then he guided us here. They carried us mostly and said we were to stay inside until his captain came. We didn't want to let them take you, but there was nothing we could do. Will you ask the head man about wine or brandy, pilot? Van Neck licked his lips thirstily, then added, Now that I think of it, he mentioned daimyo, too. What's going to happen when the daimyo arrives? Has anyone got a knife or a pistol? No, Van Neck said, scratching absently at the lice in his hair.